Hi there, this is the Athletic FC podcast weekend preview. It is match day 34 in the Premier League, but we also have the FA Cup semi-finals. My name is Adam Leventhal. Welcome if you are listening, if you are watching on YouTube as well. Alongside me is Tim Spears. It's lovely to be back in the studio with you, feeling your your warmth, your vibes. Yeah, yeah, you too, yeah. Yeah, good. Uh, Tim is here and Liam is also here, but remotely. How are you, Liam? Uh, not so good now. I felt that, that passive-aggressive dig at my non-presence. <laughs> It was. It was. No, I was remote last week, so I'm. I'm. I'm all aboard the remote train. So do not take it as a slight. Um, I wanted to ask both of you before we kick on with with everything that we're going to be looking ahead to. I wanted to talk about penalties, because Tim, obviously, we've had a, a big Champions League week. Obviously, didn't go to plan for Arsenal against Bayern Munich. Didn't go to plan for Manchester City against Real Madrid, and it came down to penalties. And you wrote in depth about the penalty shootout. Did you enjoy that process? Uh, yeah, do, do you know, yeah, it was, yeah. It was okay because you get to sort of pause and look at all this, the facial expressions and, the, and you, know, you notice things that you wouldn't do normally. I found the person who nicked the ball from after, uh, nice. after Modric hoofed it into the, the, the stand behind the goal, which was proved very costly because yeah. that ended up being... Thanks to due to my research, yeah. the longest wait in between penalties by almost double. Uh, Bernardo Silva had to wait a minute before he took his penalty. It's which a ended big part being, of it. So the fan who nicked the ball cost their team. Interesting. If you want to read more about it, I mean, it's on the Athletic right yeah. now, isn't it? Yeah. So we've got two three o'clocks on Saturday: Luton against Brentford. Sheffield United against Burnley. We will be talking about the relegation scrap later on, which involves, obviously, all four of those teams. Then at 5.15, it is Man City against Chelsea at Wembley in that first FA Cup semi-final. We'll have a focus on that as well. Then back to the Premier League at 7.30 on Saturday. Arsenal trying to get back on track against Tim Spears' Wolves at Molyneux. Yep. How much would you give... For one day, yeah, you to manage Wolves. That's not going to happen. Uh, uh, owning, maybe. Oh, yeah. oh, so so owning the club is more that's likely. My only, than... That's my only route now. Okay. I've got to win the lottery and then and then I'd buy Wolves. Okay, yeah. fine. So there's still a chance. There's still a chance. <laughs> we digress. Um, back onto Sunday, uh, we've got Everton against Nottingham Forest. Also part of that relegation scrap chat that we'll have a little bit later on. That's at one thirty. Uh, Crystal Palace against West Ham and Aston Villa versus Bournemouth is at three o'clock on Sunday. And then it is Fulham against Liverpool at 4.30. And then sandwiched between those Premier League games on Sunday is the other cup semi-final. Wolves' Conquerors, Coventry against Manchester United. But we're going to be starting with Manchester City against Chelsea. So it is indeed the first semi-final and Liam, let's focus on, on Chelsea, first of all, because it's been another strange season for, for the fans, for the, for the people covering the, the side as well. Um, they're ninth in the Premier League, albeit they do have that game in hand. And if they win, they're going to be up to sixth potentially in the league. They've still got a chance to, to get into Europe via the Premier League. There's still a lot to play for, but it does feel like there's a lot riding on this, this FA Cup semi-final and, and the potential of winning a trophy. Um, has there been a, a lot of focus behind the scenes on on winning the FA Cup, or is it just a byproduct of a of a topsy turvy season? I don't know if it's necessarily been a focus, but naturally, as the further you get into these tournaments, the more prominent it becomes in in the minds of the players, in the minds of the coach, and in the minds of supporters that that winning it could be a possibility. I mean, that notion took a blow when they drew Manchester City in the semi-final, yeah. just as it did last year when they drew City away in the third round of both domestic cups. That kind of uh, scuppered any notion of of lengthy cup runs at the, at the very start for Graham Potter. Um, but it is there for them now. You know, I, th I think they, they know that they've played Manchester City well twice this season in two very, very different games. And so I think they will fancy themselves to a degree 
to come up with a game plan that causes City problems and to execute that game plan at a level that means we've at least got a competitive game at Wembley. Uh, I don't really expect it to be like the 4-4. I expect it to maybe be a little bit more like the 1-1 at the Etihad. Um, but no two games against the Pep Guardiola team are the same, I don't think. I think he'll have spent a long time looking at that Etihad match and how Chelsea cause City problems, the kinds of traps that they set for them in possession, what they did with Rodri in particular, Conor Gallagher shadowing him. And I'm sure Pep will have some left field uh, manoeuvres of his own in, to, to try and shake things up a bit. But there, there is a degree of confidence from Chelsea. They, they, they've played City well and they've tended to lift their game for the better teams this season. Tim, I want to talk to you about wounded animals, mm. if that's OK. Um, are City going to be a wounded animal that's, you know, sad and down and l literally licking their wounds? Or are they going to be like a, a cat that we were talking about <laughs> off air that's very, you know, aggressive right. and, and defensive and is going to attack because oh, they, want to, they want to get revenge and, and want to make up for that bitterness of losing out on the Champions League. Uh, crikey, there's a lot There's a lot to unpack there. Mm. Uh, are they going to be sad, you said? Yes, probably. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, there's quite a quick turnaround. Guardiola's probably cursing the fact that this isn't on Sunday. Um, I mean, the game's come so thick and fast. This literally only happened very late last night and we're already talking about, you know, it's it's uh, it's it's coming up very quickly on Saturday. Um, I think this this is going to define the run-in as, as to how these teams cope with their European exits. We spoke on last week's show about the possibility of City v Arsenal in the semi-final yeah. of the Champions League and how that would impact the run-in around it. Well, yeah, they're both out of Europe, so how do they come back from adversity this weekend? We've seen with, with Liverpool how the first leg of the Atalanta game had such an impact on the Palace game for me last weekend. So, yeah, I think it's a good time to play City um, when you've got Rodri asking for time off and when you've got Haaland and De Bruyne apparently asking yeah. to be substituted last night. I'm not sure if it was as clear-cut as that. But Guardiola basically said, yeah, they asked to come he on. He referenced that, didn't he? Yeah. Which I find astonishing in the biggest game of the season that they're feeling a little bit too tired to carry on. Not sure about that. But still, it kind of reflects um, the position that they're in. It's been a very draining title race. Um, Liverpool looked knackered against Palace last weekend. Arsenal looked very tired against Munich last night. They looked like they were running on an empty. Players like Saka in particular. So, yeah, yeah. Um, how you cope with that fatigue and, and adversity is going to be key to what all these clubs do in the next few weeks. Let's talk about Cole Palmer, Liam. Um, how much have you enjoyed watching his his journey so far this season? And how surprised have you been um, how much he's exceeded expectations? I mean, because there wasn't necessarily any any expectation of him really this season, was there? Well, the only expectation there was of him from outside Chelsea came in the form of a piece that we did for The Athletic shortly after the, the summer window concluded, where we spoke to a load of agents anonymously. And he was the consensus pick mm. as the worst signing of, I believe, deadline day, but it might have been the entire window. Um, people couldn't understand why Chelsea had paid so much for a guy who was buried in Manchester City squad, who barely played in the Premier League to that point. And they all know exactly why now. You know, he he's... Really, you know, an emerging Premier League superstar, I don't think that's too strong to say. This is a, a large enough sample size and he's been consistent enough that it merits that kind of that 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 kind of billing. Um and the biggest surprise for me has been that he was good from day one. From the moment he started playing in this team, he's shown the qualities that you see from him now just making good decisions whenever he gets the ball and taking responsibility, assuming a leadership role in what is a very young squad. And when I say leadership, I don't mean, you know, ordering players about and, and acting like a captain, but being like a technical leader on the pitch, you know, someone who always wants the ball, who wants the, the burden of scoring or creating. And I don't think we haven't seen enough of those players at Chelsea actually in the last few years. And for someone who wants that, but is also good enough to justify it regularly while being also a natural showman. I mean, you, you look at his first goal against Everton, the nutmeg 
uh, of Branthwaite, the little flick round the corner and and then the finish. That's one of the best goals of the season mm-hmm. by anyone. It, and it sums up Cole Palmer. It's not just the quality, it's the swagger and the general way that he carries himself on the pitch. Are you a big fan of Cole Palmer? In terms of, of him taking responsibility at such a young age and such an inexperienced player. Yeah. It's not like he's been around the lower leagues on loan for the last few years. He's just coming from playing uh, on Man, uh, Man City's academy pitch to, to do this in the Premier League and just looks totally cool with it all. Um, yeah, it's bit, I mean, he's, what, the form player in the country at the moment, mm. probably, certainly in terms of goal scoring. I think it's 11-6, and six, mm-hmm. which is insane. Um, and yeah, it's high motivation for him to do it on an extremely big stage on Saturday. Yeah, obviously against his his former side. I mean, is it is it? I hate to use a cliche, but is it written in the stars that he's going to play a, a match winning role, or do you think that? Well, this is a, a strange one, I suppose, because depending on the the real reason why Pep Guardiola sold him or allowed him to be sold, we don't necessarily know if it was linked to you know, FFP and balancing the books and thinking, well, yeah, he's a superstar that, or potential superstar that we we have to sell. We're not going to sell X rather than Y. So, yeah, he's the one that, that goes. But it does look like a misjudgment. Presumably, Pep Guardiola will be able to have a plan now for him, even though he's going to be in the opposition dressing room, do you think, Liam? I think he'll definitely be the player that Guardiola is most worried about because Chelsea's attacking plan... To a certain extent, it's been like this for most of the season, but it's become increasingly so in recent weeks. It's just give the ball to Cole Palmer and and see mm-hmm. what decision he makes because more often than not, he will pick the right option. Um, and particularly in the game at the Etihad, all of Chelsea's best attacks, and there were quite a lot of them for the first 60, 70 minutes, even though they only scored once, came from Palmer, either initiating the move with a with a line-breaking pass or... You know, committing a man, he he nutmegged Bernardo Silva at one point. You know, he he just he has the ability to create time and space for himself, which is what all of the the really impressive players uh, can do. And so, I do think Guardiola will be thinking about him a lot. As for it being a, a, a misjudgment, we've never got the impression. Uh, I'm sure our colleague Sam Lee could talk at more length about this, but we've never got the impression from Manchester City that there's a huge amount of regret. Um, I think they they felt that Palmer just wasn't going to get the minutes for them that he's getting for Chelsea, and and to get the 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 size of the role that he's getting for Chelsea. You know, it's one thing to be the the creative hub of a team that is in mid table fighting for sixth, seventh, and another to be integral to a team that won the treble last year and has a a very strong argument to still be considered the the best team in the world. Um, And I I think from Palmer's perspective as well, he was looking at it thinking, Kevin De Bruyne is the man at Manchester City today. Phil Foden looks like the man at Manchester City tomorrow. Um, Is it ever going to be my day? You know, and I think he's already the man at Chelsea. So in that sense, it's really paid off for him immediately. And I, in terms of the money, City banked. I mean, they did did some of their own business that they wanted to do, signing Jeremy Doku. There's there's an argument that it it's worked out best for everyone. But of course, if if Palmer goes on to beat Manchester City in this game and play well against them for the next ten years, then we could look upon it differently. He's the exception rather than the rule as well. When you consider the amount of money that that Chelsea have spent and that that one billion pound figure is bandied about and used as a massive stick to to beat the Bowley era. Um, And you analysed it recently. It's an article that you should dig out and not you, Liam, obviously you wrote it, but people listening um, (laughs) should dig out and read because you worked out that only four of the recruits of the one billion dollar crew have been on the pitch for more than 75 percent of Chelsea's available first team minutes since arriving. Cole Palmer amongst that group with Enzo Fernandez, Moises Caicedo and Axel de Sassi as well. Um, when you look at the that big headline figure, is there any part of you that thinks this has gone to any sort of plan so far? Or is this one billion pound figure always going to look like a mistake, especially at the beginning when it looked 
a little bit misguided. Well, one thing I've discovered since that piece went live is that from the publicly reported transfer fees, I actually underestimated Chelsea's transfer spend because once their accounts dropped, we we saw that it's actually 1.2 billion uh, over the over these first two years of Bowley Clear Lake ownership that they spent on transfers. Maybe that includes uh, the the rather lofty agent fees that made headlines as well. Um, but yeah, it's. There, there, there's no argument that it's worked as a strategy in the short term because a lot of these players have not lived up to transfer fees that honestly, you know, in some cases were were always setting them up with impossible expectations. Uh, certainly in the case of Enzo Fernandez, Moises Caicedo and Mikhailo Mudrik, it, it's really hard for young players to justify fees like that. Um, but also I think it's it's clearly not worked because of where Chelsea are in the league. They didn't drive this squad overhaul and spend this much money thinking that the rebuild would be this painful, that they would be mired in Premier League mid-table. They thought they could do this and still be competing for Champions League qualification at a minimum. And I think the fact that they haven't been doing that is a reflection on the Premier League being much stronger than they thought it was, but also the players that they've signed either not being as good as they thought they were or not being as good right now and and needing a bit more time. And there are bigger questions about the wisdom of constructing an entire squad, essentially, of under-23s. Is that the best way to develop them all? Is that the best environment to create? You saw the Real Madrid team that knocked Manchester City out, they they have young players, but they seem to have got succession planning down to a fine art. Uh, and, their, and their players, their young players already play like champions. Um, there's no one doing the, the Tony Cruz or Luka Modric role really at Chelsea in terms of mentoring. Uh, and that that's a bit of an issue. Um, and yeah, so there are big strategic questions and it... There may well be, in time, a lot more success stories than than just Cole Palmer, unqualified success stories that we can look at and say, yeah, Chelsea did good business here, but it's not obvious right now. Tim was um, shot me down because I suggested that Maurizio Pochettino had, had done well or wasn't doing as badly as everyone else was making out. Does he need to win the FA Cup and or finish in Europe to keep his job. The evaluation that will take place of him at the end of the season, and we know there will be one because he's he's got one year, one guaranteed year left on his contract with a with a year option. It's never been explained to us in in clear terms in terms of competition targets. The the impression we've always been given is that the way that the co sporting directors Lawrence Stewart and Paul Winstanley, Stanley and of course by extension the owners will look at Pochettino's performance will be a bit more all-encompassing than that. It will be is the team moving in the right direction performance-wise? Are individual players developing in the way that it was hoped they would develop? And are there relationships building within this team that can provide a foundation for the next great Chelsea team. I think those are more important than did they go out in the semi-final of the FA Cup or get to the final or win it. Obviously, it would be very nice to win it and it can't hurt Pochettino just as winning the Carabao Cup couldn't couldn't hurt him. I mean, losing it in the fashion they did probably hurt him slightly. Uh, and finishing sixth in the Premier League would definitely be better than finishing 11th. But it's going to be more about those those bigger picture things because ultimately I think the the only concrete target that would have really moved the needle for Pochettino is the one that's out of his reach which is uh, Champions League qualification. Let's get our predictions then, Tim. You uh, got one right last week, by the way. You predicted that Villa were going to win at Arsenal. I think you were just being contrary at the time, just Thanks. just for the just for the record, because everyone was predicting. That well, everyone Arsenal could go back and listen and, and no, they can. See yeah, what I said. yeah, that's fine. You got yeah. one right. Um, your prediction this week for the FA Cup semi final between Manchester City and Chelsea. 
Well, is it is it relevant? Does it matter what I say? Of course it does. But you're just saying I'm being contrary but if, if I'm saying one thing one way or the other. Well, what's more important? <laughs> what's more important? Getting it right or the thinking behind it? Uh, so I think uh, looking at Chelsea's recent defensive record, mm -hmm. they had that run of conceding minimum two goals in seven games in a row mm -hmm. and they played some rubbish in that run. They played Burnley, Sheffield United. Leeds, Leicester, you know, the Everton game doesn't solve those issues for me. I can't, I can't see them not conceding a couple of goals. Mm -hmm. And if Guardiola does a number on Palmer, I don't think they've got the firepower to sort of win 3-2 against City. So okay. I will say, yeah. so you asked for mean? a bit of reasoning. Yeah, so this, no, I like it. Uh, so I would, I would say City to win 2-1. Two, 2-1, one. Two, one. thank you. Liam, your prediction, please. Well, I've already answered this question on Straight Out Cobham, so I have to be consistent with my predictions, I think. Yeah. Or, or I just make a mockery of the whole prediction. Yeah, either, either or, you can do whatever you want. Two completely different things. Um, I actually predicted the same score as Tim, 2 1, a, a kind of late heartbreak for Chelsea. The one. The one point I'd probably differ on is I'm I'm not sure Guardiola's the type of coach that does a number on opposition players. He doesn't seem to mm. craft that many individual game plans defensively. His his defensive game plan will be stop Cole Palmer and any other Chelsea player getting the ball ever. <laughs> yeah. That seems to be his general approach. But I, I, I think there will be some tiredness in City's legs. Uh, and I think Chelsea will play them close because they have done twice this year. Uh, but I do think City will ultimately come through. Right. We shall see. Let's um, talk about the other FA Cup semi-final whilst we're here. Mm. Wolves is conquerors. Coventry City have their big day out at Wembley Stadium. Oh, wouldn't it be nice to, if it was Wolves making it to Wembley again to get into the FA Cup semi-final? But they probably would have lost like they did. The last time they just were in FYI, the Liam, I'm, I'm not saying anything because I'm, um, I'm not biting. He Co does this Co kind of thing every week. Coventry so. up against Manchester United. Coventry sit eighth in the championship. Can they do it again? Have you got a little bit of a a hope, maybe? Yeah, definitely. That they do it again. The amount of teams that Man United have been ma making look amazing in recent weeks mm -hmm. is 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 considerable. Yeah, and yeah, I watched Coventry. Com should have been a comfortable win against Wolves, to be honest. They had 24 shots at Molyneux that day. And, um, yeah, in players like Ellis Sims and Hadji Wright, they've definitely got the firepower to trouble Man United. And Man United have definitely got the defensive weakness to allow them to have chances. I think we can say in almost certainty, given the run that United have been on for months now, that they will concede chances to Coventry. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. It's a great story for, for Coventry to be there. They're going to be backed by 34,000, sold out their allocation. Um, Mark Robbins obviously done a phenomenal job. Even this season, they were struggling, weren't they, before Christmas yep. in sort of November. They were mm -hmm. they were in a relegation battle. Now they're sort of on the verge of the playoffs, but it might be too late for that. Um, so, yeah, they'll have at least 30 shots. And if Fernando <laughs> lets a couple in, then... No, I honestly think... Um, They've got a really good opportunity to um, to create one of the what would be on paper one of the biggest FA Cup shocks of all time. They've got familiarity with the with the sort of the big theatre that mm -hmm. is Wembley, obviously mm -hmm. from from the playoffs, which will work to their advantage. Um, obviously, they lost on that occasion to Luton in last season's playoff final. But do you think, just in general, though, the familiarity of those Manchester United players will be the deciding factor, or not? Um, in terms of just big, big matches, big pressure, <sighs> or I mean, not? You know, there were big games in the Champions League this season, and they they flunked all those. Um, they've been better against the better teams recently. You know, a couple of decent performances against Liverpool, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, but against teams that they're expected to beat, they've they've really struggled. You know, going back a few months now, to they played Newport in January, struggled to get past them. Um, yeah, there's 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 massive issues there. We saw last week Ten Hag again failing to sort of get hold of the dressing room and issues with Garnacho and Dallo saying completely the opposite things to what Ten Hag's been saying about conceding shots in his post-match interview and Ahmad Diallo doing things on social media and Garnacho doing things on social media. So it's just an unruly bunch of players who don't seem to play to direction. 
And when you've got that, anything can happen in any in any given game. I just want one prediction from you on this game, please, Tim. Tell me what it is. Oh, it's a real tough one. Real tough one. Because obviously you don't like Man United and you want Coventry Despite, to win because if, because if they them. then go on, they go, so you funny. go, oh, well, but Wolves, you know, they've been beaten no, by the finalists. Care. That's that's basically <laughs> it, isn't it? That's, that's I why. don't care about that. Okay. Uh, it would be hilarious. Could, I thought... Sorry, uh, I thought you made your prediction, Tim. Wasn't it 30 shots? <laughs> yeah, 30 shots. Um, can I just say one thing? That it's absolutely ludicrous that one of Coventry's best players, Casey Palmer, doesn't play in this game because he's been booked twice in the FA Cup this season. And Ahmad Diallo, who was sent off in the quarterfinal mm-hmm. for Man United, does play because he's served his red card suspension mm. in the Premier League. Do Coventry have midfielders who can run with the ball in a straight line through the middle of the pitch because that could be a bit of a problem for mm. Casemiro et al. Um, I think Coventry are going to score twice in this game. And Manchester United are going to <laughs> score. I, I think they're going to win. Yeah, 3-2. Three, 3-2. Two. Three, two. Cool. It's going to be a good weekend. Right. Let's get back into the Premier League. Right. We have next... Arsenal away at Wolves. Arsenal suffered back-to-back defeats against uh, Aston Villa, their first league loss in 2024. The 1-0 defeat then against Bayern Munich, which knocked them out of the Champions League at the quarter-final stage. In the Premier League, they are still second, head of Liverpool on goal difference. They both have 71 points. They are two points behind the leaders, Manchester City. Are they running out of steam, do you think? Because they've got a bit of a habit of doing this over the last couple of seasons. It was three out of their final nine games last season, six out of their last 12 in the 2021-22 season that they'd won. Are they on the verge? Is this their bad week? Is this where it all sort of comes unstuck? I don't, I don't know. I feel, I feel like Liverpool have massively imploded. Mm. And I feel like Liverpool have bottled. Yeah, they're not alone. Arsenal aren't Li- alone. No, no, yeah. but I'm, I'm saying Liverpool have imploded and, and bottled it, to be honest. You know, the, the, the two home games they had, Atalanta and Palace, they should be winning those games, not losing both of them. Felt like a bit of a bottle job to me. I don't see that with Arsenal. I see Arsenal, yes, tired. And I think Arteta said the other day, if we were in most of the European leagues, we'd be six to eight points clear. You know, this is this. It's ridiculous the standards that we have to reach, um, and he's probably had no reliance on too many players. I think if you look at like Saka and Odegaard and Rice, they're probably a bit tired. But to be honest, they played Aston Villa at home, who they'd already lost to this season, and you knew Emery was going to come with a plan. And Villa are the fourth best team in the country, mm-hmm. and you know we said we said last week Arsenal could struggle in this one, and Bayern Munich, who. Um, a man is by a guy who's won the Champions League. They've got players who won the Champions League. They've saved all their energy and good performances for the Champions League uh, in recent weeks. So I, I don't know if you if you look at those two games or three games with the with the two legs. I, I don't. Arsenal come up a little bit short and a bit of a lack of experience in Munich on Wednesday night. But otherwise, it doesn't feel like an implosion to me. A Saturday night will be the test because if they go and lose at Molyneux, then yeah, I think you can say the wheels have really come off. But it doesn't it doesn't feel like that. To me, we got their form before last week was astonishing. They'd won 10 of 11 in the Premier League with a nil-nil draw at Man City being the 11th. They hadn't been behind in a game all year in the Premier League, which I found amazing. And I've got to, I've got to say, uh, the Arsenal fans sort of, I know we've, I know we've got a lot, quite a few listening and there's one in, in, the, in, the, um, in the booth behind yeah. us. But the, the way that they... Two. Sorry, We've two. Got two. Sorry, two. But Rachel and Mike, just Rachel. to name check them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But the way that, you know, there were seven minutes of stoppage time for that Villa game and half the Emirates emptied and Zinchenko's getting criticised. I think he had a few boos when he was subbed off. After not li- not being behind all year, I felt I saw the wave in the white flag very early on. What's your social media? <laughs> Do you know what I mean, though? Yeah, well, that's... Yes, I do. I do know what you mean. I couldn't believe how quickly it emptied. But I think it was more of a reflection on, hang on a minute, are things coming unstuck? And the the anger, the the fear that they'd sort of let this 
Probably um, familiarity from, from a year ago, I yeah, guess. Yeah, exactly. But, but that's they're, still, only, they're only two points behind. Exactly. City. That's the yeah. point. That's the point. And even after everything you've said, you ended it. You were. You were. I was going to potentially clip up that and you know send it on WhatsApp to <laughs> Mikel Arteta. I haven't got his number. Um, because it was a. It was. It was inspirational. Let's concentrate. Let's accentuate the positives here. Arsenal well, are still in a good good situation. They aren't. I mean, they could be they could be Chelsea, Liam. They could be <laughs> Chelsea. They could be in, in, in a complete mess. Um, but they're still in the mix. And I suppose now it is about how they deal with those those two body blows against Aston Villa, against Bayern Munich, and get back on track. They were Chelsea a few years ago, minus the incredible spending. Um, yeah, they're not they're not in a, a, a terrible place, Arsenal. I I don't agree when Arteta says, you know, that any other league we'd be six to eight points clear. They've lost five games this season in the Premier League already. They've they they've won twenty two of thirty two, which is good, but it's not the standard that we've seen in this league over the last five to seven years. I know what he's getting at because peak Manchester City and peak Liverpool raised the bar for winning the Premier League to heights that we've never seen before in terms of points. But neither of those teams are in the league this year, like the peak versions of them. The maximum number of points City can finish with is 91, which is a, a lot, but it's a good four to five points less at a minimum from the heights that they were regularly scaling under Guardiola. So this is actually an opportunity for Arsenal and for Liverpool because City have slipped a little bit. And I think coming out with things like that, if you're Arteta, risks creating a little bit of a woe is me culture rather than, you know, trying to rally the troops and, and saying, look, we've still got a great opportunity here, an opportunity that we might not get every year to win the league with mid to high 80s points. Um, and that, that that's definitely there because we've seen... City have been very, very consistent in the league the last couple of months, but they're not invulnerable, as Real Madrid showed. Um, particularly away from home, I think they can be a little bit more, a little bit more vulnerable this year. So it's it's there for Arsenal. It's there for Liverpool if they can just get out of their own way. And I, I'd I'd fancy Arsenal to to do that a bit more than Liverpool, just because I think they're a little bit more of a controlled team. There isn't the huge overwhelming emotional pressure that Liverpool have with Klopp's impending departure and Arsenal uh, you know prior to the Villa game had the best defence in the league as well and I think that's a great foundation on which to to actually go and win the title. For the Arsenal fans that are getting a little bit nervy a bit worried give them a, a scouting report on Wolves at the moment Tim because I was listening to the radio last weekend I heard Gary O'Neill speaking after the game against Nottingham Forest, mm -hmm. bemoaning the amount of injuries, but at the same time not bemoaning it, saying it's not an excuse, but then saying, oh, we've got so many injuries. So he was sort of doing a semi-whinge semi wrapped up in, I'm happy, um, I'm proud of the players, etc. We're really stretched. We've only got 12, 12 players and, and all that malarkey. It was a bit, yeah, it was a bit, yeah. Um, Tell us, tell us why Arsenal potentially should be worried or not. Uh, I mean, Wolves are in the worst form of the season. You, know, you mentioned the Coventry Court final that I haven't won since then, and yeah, they've had they've had some injuries. They haven't had the glut of injuries that sort of Chelsea and Newcastle have had. Newcastle got a full team out at the moment. They're still going to beat Spurs easily last week. You don't see Eddie Howe, you know, moaning after that one. Gary O'Neill, so he's never known a situation like it. In his managerial or playing career, he really? said. Really? Yeah, he said that on the radio. There are a few that I've missed. That's weird. <laughs> I, well, they've had injuries to key players. That's been Wolves' yeah. problem. So the yeah. whole front three yeah. was, has been wiped out. And we saw at Forest last week, Mateus Cunha was now back. And what a difference he made. Mm -hmm. Scored two goals. One of them was remarkable. Uh, completely on his own in the mm -hmm. Forest half. Still managed to score. So, yeah, but... <sighs> I guess reasons that Arsenal fans should be concerned would be uh, Wolves got a good record against some of the good teams this season. They beat Man City at uh, home. They beat Spurs home and away. Uh, they also beat Chelsea home and away. And they have the capability to do that because they're very well organised. 
They're very well coached. Uh, they don't mind sitting deep and sort of relinquishing possession. Uh, they've got a couple of real midfield terriers. Um, Lamina and Jao Gomez are right up there with almost anyone in the league for sort of tackling numbers this season. And then if everyone's fit, they've got this electrifying pace on the counter-attack. Uh, Pedro Neto is still out, which is a huge mm-hmm. blow. But through Cunha, who's in the form of his career, there is someone to be worried about. Are you confident? No. No, not at all. No, n- not not given their, their recent form. I don't think you can say they can go out and uh, beat the team with the best defence in the country. Um, it's probably a good time to play Arsenal, but it's also a good time to play Wolves. What does, what does that mean, Adam? What does that mean? <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. Well, it's whoever keeps their keeps their minds on the prize. Yeah. Eyes, eyes on the prize. Yeah. Or maybe minds. And I guess whatever. that's an issue for Wolves is that the season's very nearly over. Yeah. I think if they lose this weekend, it is season over. They probably won't get into Europe. But they're already, they've already dropped down the table to 11th. They're now seven points off seventh place. So it, yeah, all, it feels like it's you gone. You still had outside sort of dreams of getting back into Europe, didn't you? Coventry games, just the whole season's just evaporated. Yeah. We all love Coventry. Right. Score predictions. Liam, quick one from you, please. I think Arsenal will win this um, 2 0. 2 0. It was 2 1 to, to Arsenal in the reverse fixture. Tim, it's going to be. 3 1 to Arsenal. Oh. oh. Yeah, but you're only doing that because then you're going to go, ooh, look, yeah, I predicted an Arsenal win. I'm so happy that Wolves won. Can't believe it on next week's show. Yeah? Brilliant. <laughs> Jolly good. Remember, we are on YouTube, so when you do put your thumb that up... That was for the YouTube. That was just for YouTube. Just, I didn't want anyone to hear that. I, was, I don't want the was, listeners to hear that. It's just no, for it thumbs was, up for that YouTube. That was a YouTube exclusive. <laughs> <laughs> right, let's focus on some of the uh, relegation battles this weekend. Um, and there are some really, really interesting games uh, that we've got. Sheffield United against Burnley. I mean, Tim, last week you condemned Burnley to relegation. They're too far away, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But if they do get those three points as they did against Sheffield United in the reverse fixture, that would still only leave them three points from safety, wouldn't it? I'm st- I've still got a, just yes, a little Matt, flame if, burning. If they'd them. won last week, they'd, be, they'd somehow sort of be in it. But you, you don't stay up without goalkeeper, let's be honest. Oh, yeah. Luton, they have got a chance of getting out of it. Um, 25 points, they're in 18th. So just one point behind Nottingham Forest and two points behind Everton. Everton and Forest take on each other. We'll talk about that in a moment. But Luton against Brentford, this is a must win, isn't it, Liam, for Luton? Yeah, I think so. And it's an opportunity for them because I think Brentford, I don't know if they feel safe, but they probably should feel safe now. Um, they're seven points clear with five games left. I don't see any way for Brentford to actually get dragged right down into it. So Luton should have the the greater drive and the hunger in this game and the the greater desperation. And we've seen from them, I think, throughout the season, they just don't stop coming. You know, they they don't have an amazing individual talent level, but they are pretty well coached. They've got fantastic collective spirit. And uh, even when games look to be getting away from them, they don't stop trying to get back. And I think as long as you do that, you've, you've got a chance. We've seen particularly before the change of coach, you know, Sheffield United throw the towel in a lot. I think Burnley have been guilty of that at times this season as well. I I can't remember many occasions when Luton have done it. And as long as you do that, you've got a chance. But they they have to put it all together into a proper performance against Brentford with as as few mistakes as possible. Going into the game between Everton and and Nottingham Forest, Mm -hmm. I mean, Liam used the phrase they're throwing in the towel. It was very odd to see a Sean Dyche side throw in the towel, which they, I mean, maybe it's unfair, but I mean, it, it was chaotic at times against Chelsea. What's your feeling on, on, on that game in particular, Everton against Nottingham Forest? Because, you know, if, if Forest win, Luton win, that could be Everton back in the relegation zone, couldn't it? Yeah, if I was an Everton fan, I'd be worried uh, Luton and Forest's run-ins are both pretty good. You know, Luton have got Brentford, Wolves, Everton, West Ham, Fulham. That's a good run. Uh, Forest have got Everton. Uh, They do have Man City at home, but then they've got Sheffield United, Chelsea and Burnley. 
Whereas Everton have got Arsenal, Liverpool in their running, and Everton just aren't scoring goals mm. at the moment. So the last three goals they've scored in the four games, they had Neto, the Bournemouth keeper, dropping the ball for Beto to score from a yard. They had a penalty at Newcastle, and then they had Calvert Lewin charging down the Burnley, poor Burnley keeper's clearance. So they're, they're sort of like not goals that you can really train for. And then they go and concede six the other night, which, as you say, is completely unlike even them this season and, and a Sean Dice team in general. So, yeah, whereas Forest have only lost one in five, uh, Forest have started scoring goals, and they look a better bet to stay up at the moment. So I, it's looking like it's going to really tighten up even more so right until the last game of the season, I think. Do you think it's going to I don't see go- anyone pulling clear, to be honest. Forest, you don't? Forest, if anyone. But. Okay, all right. So even if Brent, okay, fair enough. We want a bit of jeopardy, though, don't we? Towards the end of the season, it's, it looks as if it's obviously going to go to potentially going to go to the wire at the top. We want the Ooh. same at the bottom, don't we? Okay, Liam, thank you very much for joining us. Yeah, a pleasure. Good to talk to you guys. And to Tim, great to be back in the studio with you, me old mucker. Cheers, buddy. <laughs> Excellent. Right, that's all for today. I hope you have a great weekend uh, in the FA Cup, in the Premier League, in the Football League in La Liga, in the Bundesliga, in City A. Sure, keep going, why not? Anyway, Eredivisie, yep. you know, wherever. But not um, Scotland, apparently. But not Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy it wherever you are. Okay, thank you very much. Io's going to be back on Monday. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching on YouTube. And uh, yeah, we'll see you next time.